Okay, there we go. So I'm um, just going to show you maybe 20 pictures and just go through those. I'm going to start off with a few landscapes. And this picture, I just, um, I just really love this picture. It's just so peaceful and, and just very simple. It's uh, anybody, any of you who've been on my landscape photography courses or any of my photography courses at all will know that I really bang on all the time at keeping your composition simple. So keep, keep the detail and the clutter to the minimum. And I think this, uh, this shot helps to do that. It's a really nice, peaceful evening picture. The silhouette always cuts out all the details, all the conflicting and confusing details. And this just helps to sort of enhance the calmness of an evening. And also, taken in the Sillies on the island of Fresco, this to me says a lot about the Sillies. It's rocky islands, and the low cliffs, and the sort of the hidden harbours, which just uh, really characterise uh, that, that beautiful set of islands. So it really captures quite a, quite a nice moment for me. Sort of a similar kind of idea, just obviously a silhouette taken at sunset, just very simple, peaceful uh, image, just setting up a quite a, a nice little mood. Uh, just a very simple composition of a line of, of six trees. You might say there's six subjects, which actually would be a bit, would make it, it possibly make it quite a confusing image, but actually I think all six kind of work together to make a single subject, and it really makes a very calm and very atmospheric shot. And I, I always always love this piece, the piece that's in this picture, and it's it also illustrates for me when so sometimes how with a lot of pic photography you have to plan and plan and plan and think ahead, and and, and it can take a long time for, for good shots to come together. And other times something just pops up out of nowhere and just just grabs you. And this is this image is one of that one of those latter ones. I was actually it is in, taken in Turkey, and I was actually photographing some Roman ruins. And uh, I just uh, looked over my shoulder to uh, see how much time I had left before the sunset, and I just was confronted with this wonderful view. So I, I just uh, set up my set up the camera and just concentrated on getting these shots for a couple of minutes before I returned to the ruins. So it's just one of those lucky breaks that just grabs you, and, and, and you just offer an opportunity that you really just have to grab. But moving on to something really quite different, another image that some of you have almost certainly already seen, and it really. I really couldn't go through any any kind of image presentation without showing a couple of pictures of Iceland at least. It's taken on one of the tours that I run, as you, most of you know, I run a photography tour almost uh, every year to Iceland, not this year of course, sadly. Actually, I should be there right now running this year's Iceland photography tour. But uh, this one taken a couple of years ago on the south coast, just showing a small iceberg melting on, on the beach. But, uh, really coming in close and using a wide angle lens that enhances the drama. This is far from being peaceful and restful. This is full of energy and drama and dynamism. All that energy put there by the diagonal lines that have been exaggerated by a wide angle lens. So all the diagonal lines we have in the water and in the clouds, all kind of converging to some extent, converging on that a great block of ice there. To give you an idea of size, this is, um, that's, this, Little iceberg is about two meters across, one and a half meters high, something like that. So not not huge, but uh, not that small either. So again, this is a shot that's a uh, little bit of a lucky break, but uh, also planned to some extent as well, and involved me coming in really close, getting risking getting my feet wet. I, I probably did get my feet wet. I usually do when I do these coastal shots. And then move on to something really quite different. I saw snowy and icy. This was taken quite early on in my career, back in the mid 1990s. It uh, shows uh, Mount Everest, taken from the uh, Tibetan base, uh, the uh, sorry, the Everest base camp on the Tibetan side. So I'm standing in Tibet here at an altitude of about 5,300 meters or about 18,000 feet. And there's nothing really special about this photograph, other than the fact that it's Everest. It's not a very difficult shot to, to shoot. It's uh, you know it's fairly standard composition and and easy to line up. The, the, the hard part of it is, is being there. That's, that's the tricky bit. It's a, quite a bit of organization to get there. And that's one of the things about landscape photography. Sometimes it's not really the photographing the, the, the view itself. It's actually the sort of the preparation and, the, uh, and actually making sure that you're in the right place, in the right place at the right time. And then obviously uh, hoping for a little bit of luck. And the, the luck here, of course, is that uh, it's, it's uh, got, got some really nice, clear weather. Um, and of course, you might try and maximize the chances of luck by going there at the right time of year and being in the right place early in the morning, which is, quite, of course, what you need for a good, uh, had maximize your chances of having clear weather in, in the mountains to be there early in the morning before the cloud has a chance to come in and cover everything up. 
So it's a simple picture, but but not so, uh, but difficult to actually plan. Uh, and um, it means a lot to me because this this image was one well, sort of the <laughs> excuse the pun a bit of a high point in really very, in the uh, photography for a project called Wild China, which I was shooting it back in the 1990s, and um, it became a book. It became quite a major publication, really, and um, uh, it was. I'd say it was a quite a high point, and it, that illustrates the point to me that it's actually quite risky showing to people pictures that are important to you, but which are not really necessarily important to other people. And, it, and there's a danger then that you actually just show, show to people pictures that aren't really that fantastic. But I, I personally think this picture is fantastic. It's a simple composition, but the fact that it's Everest and is well lit and uh, shot on film, by the way, of course, and then scanned, but shot, shot on, on medium format film. So a big heavy camera carried all the way up there. Not one foot, of course, but uh, uh, that nevertheless, a lot of work to get the, get the equipment there. I'll we'll move on to another shot from that same project, Wild China. This one taken right up in the in the far northwest of China, in Xinjiang, uh, bordering with Russia and and, the, and Kazakhstan, uh, very close to the border with, with both countries. And this um, is another stunning shot. This shot really hasn't seen the light of day for quite a long time, but I've always loved this picture, this beautiful S of the river snaking its way through this primary uh, coniferous forest, way up in the Altai Mountains on the borders of uh, the uh, Canis Lake Natural, uh, uh, what was it? Canis Lake Nat Nature is there. That's right. At the foot of Friendship Peak, which is a mountain peak that marks the border with, between China and Russia, and also with Kazakhstan. So this milky colour in the river is just um, due to water. It's water flowing from a glacier, which is grinding away at the mountainside. And just uh, it's just a simple composition uh, execution. Again, the hard part is actually getting there and getting to this, getting to uh, getting to and finding this location. Shooting it again on a medium format film camera, so a big heavy hunk of, of metal and plastic to actually, and glass to carry around to actually get to this location. But I, another shot I just really, um, really encapsulates this Wild China project that I was working on at that time. So then coming back up to, uh, back up to date and back up to, back to Iceland as well, a shot or, um, no, not, not, it's not particularly necessarily this particular shot, but a view of a particular mountain that is uh, very well known for anybody, if, for anybody who's looking in photography magazines and uh, also certain, a number of advertisements as well. You'll see this, this mountain and possibly this waterfall included in, in the picture as well. Uh, I'm hoping I've managed to shoot this from a, an, an angle which is a little bit different from what most people do. Uh, shooting from a much lower angle so that the waterfall becomes a much more important part of the, of the, the frame. And this, um, this is really encapsulates the, sort of the, the wildness and the ruggedness of Iceland. And the fact that it's, it's a very, it's, it's actually quite a difficult shot to, uh, to uh, execute actually, because as you can see, the sun is off to the left of the shot. It's almost sunset. The sun is still shining on the left-hand side of the mountain. But the waterfall here is in dark, dark shadow, so it's uh, it, it's a difficult uh, contrast range to, to execute. But I, I I like what I've got here, and I, it's an image I'm, I'm, I like a lot, and uh, it's it's had quite a bit of coverage over the last couple of years. So I'm, I'm pleased with, with, with that one. Now we're going to move on from landscapes into wildlife, and uh, some of the sort of wildlife pictures I've captured down the years. Um, a lot of people think of me as being, as being primarily a landscape photographer, but that's really because uh, that's most of what I teach here in Devon, because obviously we have a lot of great landscape around here, and it's a very good uh, open air studio for us to go and practice in. But on quite a bit of my uh, travel shoots for various people, I do get to do quite a bit of wildlife photography, and this is just one small example of, of that. These show juvenile Guanaco, which, as you can see, are rather related to llamas. And this this little shot is photographed in um, a nature reserve in the far south of Patagonia, near the, near the city of Punta Arenas in Chile. And I, I just really love the rather the cuteness of this picture of all four Guanaco looking straight at me. Um, had any one of those animals not been looking at the camera, it would have actually really spoiled the composition. But uh, and, and greatly weaken the shot, but because all four are looking, at me, I think it works really well. And and it, um, I just uh, just find this picture quite sort of uh, 
it, quite, quite involving. It was quite a nice little communication between me and the, and the animals, I think. Uh, it, it was shot when I was doing a, a job for uh, Dolly Kindersley, the, the publisher Dolly Kindersley. I did a lot of photography in, in the noughties, 2000s, for their DKI Witness Travel Guides. If you have any of, of their travel guides on your shelves at home, then you may well have photography by me. Um, not so much the European guys, but certainly South America and uh, Africa and, uh, and Southeast Asia and China. Uh, their books contain photography by me. So this is just a very small example of the wildlife photography that I did for them for their books. And I think that's quite a nice segue from those juvenile um, Guanaco in South America through to Red Deer in Somerset on Exmoor. And it just illustrates how sometimes, well, um, Wildlife photography in Britain can be quite a slog. I mean, most of the wildlife is, is very shy of people. It's not quite like that in, in quite a few other countries. For instance, there's Guanaco in, uh, in Chile. I could actually drive the vehicle right up to them, more or less, and uh, they weren't too bothered. As long as I didn't get out of the vehicle, they, they weren't bothered. Um, whereas in, in Britain, in, of course, as, you, as I'm sure many of you have found out, it's quite difficult to get close to, to very much wildlife, and it can be quite uh, time consuming, especially something like red deer. But every now and then you get this incredible little piece of luck, a little bit of serendipity comes along, and not only do the deer not run away when they see you, but they actually line themselves up into an almost perfect composition, which is just a, quite a, a stroke of luck. Three adult deer and three um, little, little babies, and only one of them is looking at me. The others have been distracted by another group of people that are about 100 yards off to my right. And, um, and that enabled me to actually stand there and take a few pictures for several minutes before they realized I was there as well. And then they started to move off. Just an interesting point about this picture is actually the light was terrible because we were looking straight into the light. The sunlight was coming in over the top of the hill here. And actually the deer were, were, were hardly visible. So this is an example of uh, firstly tr trying to carefully control the light coming into the camera and then uh, some careful post, post photography processing in the computer to actually bring the deer up and make them as visible as they are. So. Uh, not, not, not an easy one to execute at the, at the photography stage or indeed at the post photography processing stage as well. And then a, a, a picture of these absolutely stunning common blue butterflies, a pair mating. And uh, I just think this picture works fantastically. It just shows the absolute beauty and color of these butterflies, something that a lot of people really overlook in Britain, because these butterflies are tiny, they're only about a centimeter across, so they're very hard to photograph. And of course, as uh, any photographer, any nature photographer will know, butterflies do tend to fly off rather too easily, and they can be a real nightmare to photograph. But as I discovered, well, firstly, uh, a pair of uh, mating butterflies doubles the size of your subject, which helps enormously when you're doing macro photography, but also they become much, much more um, much more reluctant to fly away so you can get get in much closer to them before they start to to uh, get a little bit antsy and even if, even if they do fly off they usually don't go very far before they land and settle again so uh, enabling me to actually concentrate on photographing quite quite nicely but quite apart from that the major challenge here on photographing these these fellows was that it was actually a very windy day and, and the plant they were on was waving back and forth uh, quite incredibly so i had to get take a lot of shots to get a few that were completely in focus. I have a lot of pictures where one or one butterfly or the other is sharp or half is sharp and, and so on. Uh, but I have ended up with, a, with a three or four that um, three or four that uh, were completely sharp right the way across, and that indicates anybody who's done macro photography will know that your depth of field, that is the amount of picture that is sharp, is absolutely minute, probably only about a centimeter or so. And so you've got to have your the axis of your camera lens absolutely at right angles to the to the subject, and, that, and that's happened in this picture purely by chance, really, because the wind obviously uh, stopped blowing enough for, for a second or two for me to line the camera up correctly and get it focused on to get get this shot. I've just thrown in uh, one underwater fo uh, photo. This shows uh, a, a, what's called a sea fan, which is an enormous p uh, kind of uh, soft coral is not strictly speaking not soft coral but most people think of it as soft coral and this fan is about two meters across so it's, it's pretty big photographed in the philippines on a coral reef in the philippines and just stunning i don't do a, a great deal of underwater photography um and when i do it's in the tropics where the water is nice and clear and warm and uh, life is, is fairly comfortable and uh, obviously the challenge with underwater photography first of all is actually being able to dive 
and then secondly investing in the quite expensive equipment that sometimes you have to have and then uh, learning how to take photographs of the water as well as the, uh, the dive at, at the same time as uh, coping with the diving as well. Uh, also with underwater photography uh, you almost always have to do quite a bit of post photography processing because the pictures come out can be a bit of a mess with a lots of uh, light reflect right from the flash reflecting off the stuff that's suspended in the water and that was certainly the case with this picture as well it takes a lot of processing so uh, it can be kind of time consuming turning out uh, reasonable pictures of, of underwater shots but this I think has worked quite well and shows really a beautiful underwater environment in the in the Philippines. I'm just going to show you a couple of pictures of uh, animal portraits of, of captive animals and obviously a lot of people do quite understandably say that wildlife photography should be done in the wild and in, and in, the, and in the perfect world they would be absolutely dead right. Uh, the problem of course is that you often don't have the time or the budget to, to go uh, investigating many some animals in the wild and uh, with a lot of them you would really never get close enough to get this kind of portrait. You might get this close, in a, this close to a, uh, an orangutan, and if you go to certain places in um, in in Borneo where the orangutans get fed, or where there's a cap, sort of a semi-captive breeding centre where the animals are used to having people around, but generally speaking, it's, it's much hard, it's very hard to get good close portraits of animals if you don't do captive uh, captive species or captive individuals, I should say. Anyway, this I just love this portrait because it is just. Uh, almost human, I did that hand coming up to his face, this is a, obviously male orangutan, a hand coming up to his face is just um, scarily human and so is the expression I think in his face, I just love it, it's just it's very peaceful, sort of, well not peaceful, thoughtful look in his face and of course in evening sunlight so really catching the, the beauty of his, of, his, uh, of his red fur, just uh, really helping, uh, catching it and then lighting up his face really rather nicely as well. And a similar kind of idea, she photographed in the same zoo actually, both of these portraits are photographed in Nanjing Zoo in eastern China. This shows a golden snub-nosed snub monkey, which is a kind of monkey which is unique to the forested mountains of, uh, of southwest and western China. Uh, this one is a captive animal and uh, just again evening sunlight showing up this incredible red fur that they, that they have. Um, <coughs> and um, it's just a, a, a superb uh, portrait, I think. Uh, you might ask, well, why photograph him with, with his eyes closed? Uh, I do have quite a few pictures of, of him with his eyes open, but I just really like this idea with the eyes closed. It just looks very thoughtful and just really, uh, just, you, just it makes me wonder, well, what's he thinking? Was he sort of dreaming about forested mountains and, and, and the sort of freedom, or was he just having a nice quiet moment to himself? And the, the, I think the light, of course, is for really beautifully. What perhaps doesn't quite show up is the fact that these monkeys have these beautiful blue faces. And in this particular individual, individual the, the face is kind of uh, uh, burned out a little bit, so you can't really see the blue uh, quite as well as you might like. Anyway, moving on from wildlife on, and onto buildings. And this kind of architectural shot of a simple view of St. Michael's Tower on the summit of Glastonbury Tor taken at Somerset. Those of you who know my books, that this is, or uh, well, the right hand half of this picture is the cover of, of my latest book, Beautiful Somerset. And it's just, I just love this, the, the, sort of the, the composition of this, the sun setting immediately behind this tower, showing off these clouds. And those people really placed uh, in, in, that, in that composition. They were actually there. I didn't put them there myself. They, they really were there. So I like this, this evening uh, sunlight composition. Of course, architectural photography doesn't have to be that, but just about single buildings, it can be about entire skylines if they make a good composition. And it, in this instance, uh, sunrise uh, over the Pudong district of Shanghai is one such fabulous uh, uh, silhouette. It's a little bit slightly complicated silhouette, it's true, but nevertheless, quite a, a solid and interesting silhouette. Uh, the Pudong area is sort of isolated from everything else around it by this huge curve in the Huangpu River, so cutting it off from everything else, and so you get this, just this isolated block of silhouettes, silhouetted buildings uh, set against the rising sun. And then the Titanic Museum in Belfast. Again, a, a, well, a single building, but a very modern building, and really just about the geometry and the shape, not about the de overall detail. 
just looking at the, the, the sort of mathematical shapes in the, in the building and just really uh, catching the evening light and just showing off a really really nice geometric kind of photograph which is uh, one of the it's just something i like like about this shot very simple composition and then moving on really from buildings into into abstract street photography just again another shanghai picture taken at night and traffic streaming around around about i've got a, quite a few pictures taken of this of, of, of the traffic swirling around obviously just a, a long exposure traffic swirling around and around about and they all work quite well but this one has this added extra of this cyclist down in the bottom right hand corner and it catches your eye and actually can't, i can't help wondering does he survive the night does he ever get across the roundabout alive and uh, i always think that triggers quite a nice nice little uh, sort of conundrum about how on earth is he going to make it across as well as this car that's to his left as well how are they going to break through all that traffic that's swirling around the roundabout but it's a great um, and very vivid and vibrant uh, angular and swirling abstract composition another abstract kind of people or street view kind of uh, image uh, the really crazy uh, Ot ottery tar barrels festival held every november in, in ottery st mary i don't know if it's happening this year probably not i suppose but a really difficult situation to photograph in you're in darkness you're in an incredibly crowded situation and then you've got this bright blazing light of these blazing tar barrels racing through the streets, people scattering in every direction. And you really can't see very well what you're photographing. It's just, you have, obviously can't use a tripod, you have to hand hold. And you're just firing away with the flash going off, sometimes going off, sometimes not. Some of the pictures you get are quite sort of standard, other times they're really quite abstract. And uh, this is one of those. This, this picture has kind of grown on me slowly over the last few months. And I just find it such an energetic, dynamic picture. Everything, almost everything is blurred and yet the flames and the, and the sparks coming off the barrel are dead sharp and it's, it's full of energy and dynamism and all the background detail has gone due to, to blur so you're not seeing shop signs or, or details of people at all. You're just seeing that there are people there but not anybody in detail which is always, which it often is a really great thing. I'm going to move on from there to actually people. So a distant shot of three surfers on the, on the beach at Saunton Sands, just a great simple silhouette really setting up uh, a nice sort of atmospheric shot of, of people on their way to surf in Swords and Sands. It's a very simple composition and I always find that simple makes some, makes some simple compositions make some of the strongest uh, some of the strongest images. And then another simple, simple composition, which is not a silhouette, but a simple idea, uh, the grape harvest at a vineyard near Pasto. Just a nice sort of easy going sort of image that uh, captures uh, sort of someone at work in, in, in this vineyard. So an, an, an alternative form of agriculture really in the southwest, which is, is sort of slowly growing in importance. And I find this image contrasts really quite nicely with the next one, which shows uh, a man reading a newspaper in a, in, in a pool of light inside of a, uh, a Buddhist temple in Vietnam. Uh, this was taken a long time ago, right at the beginning of my photography career. Uh, at a time, I was there actually for Singapore Airlines. And they were just about to restart flights from Singapore into uh, Ho Chi Minh City after the long um, stoppage of flights following the Vietnam War. And in 1991, Singapore Airlines were just restarting, so they had me there taking pictures for, of the city. And this was just a really nice sort of quiet moment grabbed inside this, this temple. It's quite a dark building, and this man was just sitting there reading the, the newspaper in a pool of light, so engrossed in his article that he had no idea I was there taking pictures, even though I was standing quite quite close to him. I just really like this this kind of, of people photography, not sort of not staged in any way. And then I finish off uh, with this one shot, which goes right back to my days in Taiwan, which was uh, again early or mid 1990s. Uh, at the time when I was uh, living in Hong Kong, but working quite a bit in Taiwan. And uh, all, when I first started giving talks about 15 years ago, I would nearly always end my talk with, uh, with this particular image, uh, saying that uh, wherever you go in the world, almost invariably the, the, the locals are hugely uh, friendly. And uh, this is always uh, it's kind of a shot which I really quite like because it kind of sets out that idea. And I really like, uh, like, like, this, like this one. It's a very um, I think it's just a really fun image. So that's kind of the end of photography. Just a quick plug at the end, as always, 
about my books, about the Southwest, the Wild Southwest, and, and, and the books on Somerset, Devon, and Cornwall. And then, of course, the website, NigelHicks.com, with, with the photography tour, courses and tours, gift vouchers, and the online, obviously, the program back before this, these online talks, photo portfolios, and, and there was a blog, which I'm, I'm a little bit uh, um, irregular about recently, but hopefully will improve. And then the next talk will be 14th of October, talking about composition, which I'm, I hope you will like to enjoy, or like to join, I should say. Anyway, so I'm going to stop sharing the screen now, and then uh, if you want to switch on your microphones, so you can ask questions. That was a little bit of a whistle-stop tour, but uh, hopefully, if you want to be able to ask any questions, that would be terrific. Or oh, if you can hear my dog in the background there. He's... I've got three chat things here from Peter Sharps. Oh, stunning. Thanks very much. Camel Valley. Uh, oh, actually, no, as I said, that was the vineyards in, uh, in, near Padstow. So I'd like to switch your microphones back on. So anybody, if you want to ask, we can just go into the chat if you want to ask me any questions in the chat. Either way, if you want to do either the chat or just talk to me, whichever you prefer. Any questions? I'm very interested to know how often you use the tripod for your photography. Ah. Oh. Is that, a, I mean, is it your preferred choice or do you like hand holding when you can and just relying on the tripod when it's absolutely necessary? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm lazy like most people. If I can get away with the hand holding, I will. But uh, certainly for landscape photography, almost always is, a, is the tripod because uh, with, with most landscape photography, you really need to have quite a big depth of field. So it means you're going to use a very narrow lens aperture and that means a very slow shutter speed. So uh, usually tripod for that. Uh, a lot of other things, wildlife photography generally will be hand holding because most wildlife is moving around quite a bit. If you put the camera on a tripod, you find you just don't have enough uh, freedom of movement to actually be able to uh, home in on, that, on, on the wildlife quickly enough. If I'm photographing plants, that's a, a different thing. Then often will be on a tripod for plants unless it's windy and I have to use a fast shutter speed anyway. Um, but most other things, um, architecture, yeah, again, obviously, if it's in the evening, if it's getting dark, then that will always be on a tripod. But daytime, or often we'll handhold if I possibly can. Yeah. So it's variable. It varies a lot. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Nigel, which cameras are you using now? Um, using all, all Canons. Canon will be very pleased to hear that. It's, um, yeah, I use um, <coughs> I've got, uh, two camera bodies. I have the Canon, uh, the EOS, 7, EOS 7D Mark II and the EOS 5D Mark IV. Do Canon have the equivalent of the Panasonic dual IS, dual image stabilization? Um, I think the new R cameras do, I believe. Oh, right. I'm not too sure. Yeah. Because I, I find that brilliant. When you say I'm dual. Using, it uses uh, the IS in the body and the lens at the same time. Right. Yeah. No, I think the new R cameras do, but I'm not entirely sure. I haven't really looked that closely at them but I think they do. So I'm I'm using um, ISO around about uh, 12,000 or so. Oh gosh yes. And uh, an aperture of f16 or f22. Yeah. With an 800 mil lens handheld. Right. To photograph insects. Oh okay. <laughs> right. And that gives me en enough depth of field to get them um, mm -hmm a garden spider with prey all in focus that's that's pretty that's pretty fantastic yep yep mm -hmm. it you must works, have a, you must have an extension tube on there as well because you need to enable oh, that yeah, yeah. Your lens to focus in really closely so i'm focusing at about four or five feet right yeah to, okay. to fill the frame with uh, uh, a large white butterfly okay sure now i do something similar quite often especially for butterflies which you find very hard to get close to is I use a 300 mil lens with an extension tube so that the extension tube en enables the 300 millimeter lens to uh, focus yeah. in quite close without having, without me having to get that close to the butterfly it's often yeah. better than using a macro lens well yeah. mine, mine's actually a 100 to 400 oh, okay. with micro four thirds it's 200 to 800 ah uh, yeah okay right of course yep 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 okay 
Angel, what what aperture did you use for that uh, the butterfly shot? Do you remember? I could look it up, but I don't remember off offhand. I just, just uh, I would have been using a pretty fast shutter speed because it's quite windy. So I suspect yeah, it's the length, the aperture is not that that excuse me, that, probably not that narrow. I would guess, but I would guess I've, it's difficult to do insects on less than f11 because uh, of the tiny depth of field. But I'm, I'm just guessing now. I could look it up and let you know. If you want me to want, want to find out. Hi, Nigel. It's Mark. How are you doing? Hi, Mark. Yeah, and uh, Mandy. Hi there. Nice to see you. And you're you're right, mate. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for tonight. I really enjoyed your presentation. I've got a quick question for you about your Icelandic picture. Oh yeah. So is that with a filter or is that exposure blending in a computer? Which one are we talking about? Is that the iceberg? No, the, the, water, the waterfall and the the nice mountain. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, the um, um, Kirky uh, Fells. Yes, yeah. uh, that is with um, no, no. It's it's with a, with a, an Endigrad filter on top of the on, on the top part of the picture where it's very bright, and then a little okay. bit of pr uh, processing as well in the computer to to, to lighten the waterfall and, and darken the top part of the picture as well a bit further. So, uh, okay. not blending not blending two pictures together. No, just one shot. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're very welcome. Perfect. Mm -hmm. I thought it might be filters. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? No, I've bamboozled, bamboozled you. It was a bit of a flying tour of some of the pictures I've done. It's, uh, it's uh, never too sure how many pictures we can get into 40 minutes, but I sort of I thought I'd give you a fairly reasonable uh, wash of, of the kinds of things I've been doing and, and give you sort of a little bit of an idea of how and, and why and, uh, and what. Well, I like these particular pictures. So uh, if nobody else has got any questions, we'll sort of wind up. Now the uh, next um, talk, as I said, is on the 14th of October, and there's going to be three more before, uh, before Christmas, 14th of October, 11th of November, and the 9th of December on composition, light, and landscapes in that order. Uh, if you'd like to come along, uh, well, obviously registration on the website will open in the next couple of days. I'll get that loaded up. If you want to come along, then either go to the usual registration process for I have it up for all three talks, so you can register for all or any of the talks you want to. Either go, go through the usual reg the same registration process as you did for this talk, or just drop me an email to let me know that you want to sign up, and I'll, I'll put you down on the list for, for, for whichever talks you want to do. Okay, so uh, that would be great. And uh, um, I think that really is it, unless anybody else has any, any other questions. I was just looking at my crib sheet, make sure I haven't forgotten to say anything, but I think I'm okay. So. Just one quick question, please, um, Nigel. When you did the photograph of the lady in the vineyard, right. did you um, ask her to take that pose at all? Or were you just literally watching her and tuning in at the right moment? Mostly the latter. They, I, when I'm doing this kind of thing, I will often just say, oh, just, just ignore me, just carry on. But if I say freeze for a moment, then, then I ask them to do that. The trouble is when, when I say, people, say to people, just hold it there, then they usually freeze in some kind of really awkward position. Most people are not natural enough to actually freeze in a, in a get a little bit nervous in front of the camera for whatever reason. Uh, that particular woman was, was actually pretty good, so that, that, it didn't really have that, that, that problem with her. Uh, I, I think with that particular shot, I probably did ask her to, to hold that, sh that angle for, for just a moment or two because it was quite a nice clear shot of both her and the grapes, which was actually not, not as easy to, to get as uh, I thought it would be. Yeah. How do you lock off? Thank you very much. Great evening. Well, thank you. Thanks also. got a me uh, message from Zed to thank us. Thank you for the talk and thank you for everybody coming and also from uh, Paul Israel as well for uh, asking the same thanks to me. And, and also from Carol. Thank you, Carol, as well. So great. So thanks, everybody, for coming. I really hope uh, it's been a good evening it's for you. Uh, it's been a fantastic evening for me. So, so many people want to come and listen to me. I really wasn't too sure how many people would want to come along. So it's been a great experiment to start this. And hopefully the next few will be at least as well uh, attended. And I really look forward to seeing you all then. So thank you very much. And those that are booked into upcoming photography talk, uh, courses, I should say, they are going to happen. Woohoo! And <laughs> so uh, uh, hopefully we will be able to carry on doing the remainder of this year's photography courses all the way through till November, without, uh, unless something terrible happens in the next couple of weeks. But uh, 
anyway, fingers crossed. So uh, talk to you, see you all again soon, hopefully. Uh, we'll, we'll close this meeting down and leave whenever you feel like it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much, much Nigel. Thank bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.